And the first question was to me, how the governments would help scientists. And, uh, for my tool or vehicle here is, uh, is the ministerial declaration as an outcome of this United Nations Environment Assembly. And if you read this document, which will be adopted hopefully on Friday, uh, there is lots of lots of attention on how we engage academia, how we, we collaborate with, with the scientists. Uh, there are promises to invest in such cooperation. And there are lots of attention to environmental data monitoring, investing in these technologies. And which has been my priority, one of the two actually, the other one is, is um, reduction of plastics, especially single use plastics. But, but uh, the main priority to me has been comparable environmental data. Then we can build on it if we agree to, to common data strategy to be worked out by UNEP actually. We give this task to UNEP, of course, in collaboration with the member states. But without comparable environmental data, we cannot move ahead. And this, I hope, will be the, the, one of the best results of this assembly here. Thank you. Uh, the question from Hali, um, whether we will put pressure on governments. I would prefer to use the language of we will show the sense of urgency for inaction. I think the professors have put it very nicely that time is running out, whether you are looking at this from the context of the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, definitely we will keep on emphasizing time is running out message. Uh, we will do so in collaboration with other UN agencies. Uh, as you know, the scale of the challenges outlined may seem daunting and our response is just one of. Uh, the professor spoke about collective action, partnerships that everybody's can play a role, and those are the kinds of partnerships and relationships we will keep on pushing. We will continue doing the advocacy work, both politically, uh, but also science-based. And I think it's fair to say this publication is an indication that we bring data and well-researched science to policy conversations that are going to happen here in Nairobi and after Nairobi. But also, we will continue to um, scale up our engagement on policy around the issues that um, the report has outlined. So our commitment is there, both as an entity, but also as part of the collective action that is required behind the challenges. Thank you. Uh, let, me, let me pick up the jobs question. Uh, we, we don't look into the jobs issue in a great deal of detail, but you won't be surprised to hear that it's one of my main concerns in my own academic life. Um, we're talking here about a huge structural change to the economy. No sector is going to be unchanged if we manage to move towards those sustainable development goals. Um, and that means that all jobs need to become green jobs. All jobs. The person who's driving an electric bus that is going to be a green job when that electricity is powered from uh, renewable sources. Uh, we, the, the, the circular economy is going to need a huge amount of work. Uh, throwing stuff into holes in the ground or just leaving it to get into rivers is not a very intelligent way to proceed. We have real jobs there that can turn that into a circular flow of materials. We need a completely revitalized food system, building on the wisdom and experience of the billions of small farmers around the world. Those farmers who grow sustainably with fewer chemicals, those 
are green jobs. And finally, the change that is most obviously underway, and where we actually have really good numbers from IRENA, the Renewable Energy Agency, is the shift from fossil fuel jobs, particularly coal mining jobs, which cause people to die very early, to renewable energy jobs, which are more numerous and which are clean and generate power that is clean and can be generated anywhere where there is sun and wind. And that puts Africa in particular in an enormously strong position. Because you don't have to be one of the few countries with fossil energy resources to have more energy than you need and the technologies to help you realize that energy for your development are now available and that's going to be an enormous number of green jobs. So there's an enormous surge of uh, industrial transformation that is going to go on in all those sectors and all those jobs are going to be green jobs. Thanks. And if I may add, in our report we do focus on how a healthy planet enables good functioning jobs. Um, so if you have healthy fisheries, for example, it supports 58 to 120 million people in the small scale fisheries sector. If you have healthy land, then it supports 3.2 billion people. Uh, conversely, if the land is getting degraded, and right now that's the situation, then degraded land is in the area where 3.2 billion people now live. Um, if you look at healthy forests, they support 1 to 1.5 billion people's livelihoods. So in a sense what you're seeing is that throughout the report we talk about how